best way to get a fabulous fortune is to inherit one. Vast riches can be gained by a simple accident of birth. Keeping it in the family is what dynasties are all about. A hundred years ago, much of the world was ruled by a handful of royal dynasties. When Queen Victoria, ruler of one in four of all living souls on earth, died, two emperors, two kings, 24 princes and 13 dukes followed her coffin. Within 20 years, most had lost their crowns. For the first time in history, the 20th century has challenged the idea of inherited wealth. In a world marked by social change and revolution, the old order has found its privileges and wealth slipping away. Old money had to embrace new money to survive. Old blood and new blood were mixed to invigorate dynasties trying to adapt to the changing world. But vast wealth doesn't guarantee happiness. As tragedy and crisis strike at the heart of some of the most enduring dynasties, it is left to the new generation to pick up the pieces, to adapt and change with the times, and to ensure the continuation of the dynasty. In the 20th century, the unthinkable has happened, as even the most ancient dynasties have been threatened by a rising new order. Egypt is home to the greatest dynasties the world has ever known. In 1936, 16-year-old King Farouk ascended the Egyptian throne. He inherited $100 million, 200 cars, and 75,000 acres of the most fertile land on earth. Little did he realize he would be Egypt's last pharaoh. With a fabulous fortune at his disposal, Farouk lived a life of gargantuan excess. His love of women was legendary matched only by his love of food. He thought nothing of polishing off a dozen eggs for breakfast, followed by 40 quail for lunch. Gambling was another passion. A $150,000 loss in a seven-hour game of Baccarat caused him to barely bat an eye. Following the failure of his first marriage to produce the all-important son and heir, Farouk proposed a marriage to a 17-year-old commoner, Naran. He was almost twice her age. Farouk's new bride was the daughter of his jeweler's mistress. The jeweler played dynastic matchmaker and orchestrated an encounter in his shop. The king was smitten. Farouk showered his new bride with gifts. A trousseau alone was worth a quarter of a million dollars. A wedding gown was a magnificent affair, studied with more than 20,000 diamonds. On honeymoon, Nariman spent thousands of dollars in Paris on haute couture maternity wear. But the lavish 13-week tour of Europe would be the king's swan song. July 23, 1952, tanks laid siege to Farouk's palace. After months of civil unrest, the revolutionary free officers movement demanded the king's abdication. A fabulous fortune in gold ingots was stashed in crates of champagne and smuggled on board the royal yacht. 
But as Farouk fled with his family, he was forced to leave behind the bulk of his wealth. Exiled to Italy, his wife left him, and his longed-for son grew up to become part of the international jet set. Farouk died at the age of 45, allegedly killed by the Egyptian secret police. With him died any hope of restoring the ancient monarchy. The Egyptian dynasty was not the only one to face the onslaught of the 20th century. War, revolution and sweeping social change have taken their toll on the ruling dynasties of the world. Vast fortunes built up over generations have been lost, swept away by the great tidal wave of history. Queen Victoria's grandson, the German Kaiser Wilhelm II, marched on Europe. The Great War would be not only his own undoing, but that of countless other monarchs. Within a decade, more than half of humanity had overthrown the hereditary rulers. Two days before peace was declared, the Kaiser abdicated. Germany became a republic, and the once mighty ruler left to live in exile in Holland. The Kaiser was allowed to retain the bulk of his one and a half billion dollar fortune, but stripped of his power, he became little more than a peep show. Guests at the small cafe opposite his house in Dürn could pay 25 cents for a view over the railings into his house and garden. Germany's last Kaiser had become a tourist attraction. Fledgling royal dynasties have found themselves overtaken by the events of history. In 1939, Mussolini threatened to invade the Balkan state of Albania. King Zog, king for just 10 years, 10 months and 10 days, vanished. So too did the country's treasury. When he resurfaced in London, Zog was the richest king in exile. Not all deposed kings have been so prepared. When Italy voted to become a republic in 1946, a thousand years of rule by the House of Savoy came to an abrupt end. Umberto II, monarch for just 36 days, arrived in Portugal with only three shirts to his name. But of all the tales of the end of monarchy, none is more tragic than that of the Romanovs. In 1998, 80 years to the day after their murder by the Bolsheviks, the bodies of Tsar Nicholas II, his wife and three of their five children were finally laid to rest in Russia's former capital, St. Petersburg. dynasty had ruled Russia for more than 300 years. As Tsar and Europe's last great absolute monarch, Nicholas and his family enjoyed a life of extraordinary luxury and privilege. The Tsar's court was one of the most opulent in Europe. Romanov's wealth was phenomenal. One estimate placed the Tsar's fortune at 112 billion dollars. As an absolute monarch, Nicholas administered not only his private fortune, but also that of Russia. As Tsar, he controlled the country's gold reserves worth 14 billion dollars, the largest in the world. As emperor, the crown jewels were his too. On his coronation in 1896, 
Nicholas was presented with the diamond-encrusted Grand Imperial Crown of Catherine the Great. The Imperial Scepter topped with the famous Orlov Diamond, and the Imperial Orb were the symbols of Tsarist power. But they were just a tiny fraction of the Tsar's fabulous collection of precious jewels. The famous Fabergé eggs were crafted by the creator of many of the Tsar's treasures, his private jeweler, Peter Karl Fabergé. Today, on the open market, they can fetch five and a half million dollars. But by 1914, the cold wind of change was blowing through Tsarist Russia. The royal family spent increasing amounts of time on board the royal yacht, ignoring the growing unrest in the cities. The Russian people were disenchanted with the Tsar and their own continuing poverty. But Nicholas refused to confront the public dissent. He turned increasingly to his German-born wife Alexandra for advice. Russia's Tsars had always believed their power was granted by God, but the days of divine Romanov rule were drawing to a close. On August 1st, 1914, Germany declared war on Russia. Twelve million men were sent to the front lines to fight in appalling conditions. The Tsar appointed himself commander-in-chief and left the running of the country to his wife. In two years, prices rose more than 400%. Unrest grew, stoked by the revolutionary rhetoric of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. The Tsar's return from the front came too late. As his once mighty empire plunged into revolution, Nicholas, last Tsar of all the Russians, was forced to abdicate. Here, the Romanovs lived under house arrest. The trappings of royalty were gone. The family were put on soldiers' rations. In 1918, the Bolsheviks decided to finish with monarchy once and for all. On the 17th of July, the family were led into the cellar of the Apatiev house in Ekaterinburg and executed. Three hundred years of Romanov rule had come to a bloody end. Five days before the massacre, Lenin had nationalized the Tsar's property and confiscated the riches of the Russian church. 500,000 kilos of silver found their way into the Bolshevik coffers. The family's private money worth $42 million was taken over by the new regime. In the 1920s, the Bolsheviks sold some of the imperial crown jewels in a desperate bid to get foreign exchange. It took less than a decade to dismantle 300 years of inherited wealth. The demise of the Romanov dynasty revealed the fragility of monarchy. The Tsar was unable to accept the need for social change. Unwilling to adapt, his fall from grace was absent. It was a potent warning that echoed in palaces around him. Some great aristocratic dynasties have learned to adapt in order to hold on to their family fortunes. For centuries they kept the dynasty's wealth intact by carefully protecting their bloodline. When it came to fabulous fortunes, 
the British aristocracy towered above their European counterparts. By the turn of the century, the richest 4% owned 90% of the nation's wealth, the top 1% an extraordinary two-thirds. The basis of their fortunes was land. Men like the 17th Earl of Derby enjoyed an annual income of $500,000 a year, the equivalent of almost 30 million today. The Duke of Westminster's estate spanned four continents and included 300 acres of the most expensive parts of London. At the turn of the century, the second Duke of Westminster's daily income was the equivalent of over $100,000 today. The current Duke is still one of the richest men in Britain, worth almost three and a half billion dollars. There were exceptions to the widespread wealth of aristocracy. Despite being born into a royal dynasty, Edward, Prince of Wales and heir to the throne, could never quite afford the riches that the lesser aristocracy enjoyed. But he was the leading light of late Victorian society. He hunted, shot and fished with the best of them. But his extravagant lifestyle came at a price. There were years when his expenditure exceeded his income by over two million dollars. Beautiful women were his greatest self-indulgence. Especially pretty showgirls. When he began an affair with the great stage star Lily Langtree, one newspaper quipped, there is nothing between the Prince of Wales and Jersey Lil, not even a sheet. When he began yet another affair with the French actress Sarah Bernhardt, a jealous debutante remarked, he's a professional lovemaker. Like his women, Edward's friends came from all walks of life and transcended the social barriers of the time. Money was a yardstick by which he measured a person's worth. Millionaires were welcomed into his circle on the condition that they picked up the bill. Jewish financiers like Ernest Castle became lifelong friends. New money dynasties helped keep Edward afloat. In return, he opened up British high society to the new classless super rich dynasties of America. In the mid-19th century, America had just three multimillionaires. By the turn of the century, there were over 4,000. America was the new engine of wealth. In one generation, families like the Rockefellers, DuPonts and Astors made fortunes that had taken the European aristocracy hundreds of years to accumulate. The Vanderbilt dynasty was amongst the richest. Railroads had made their millions. Their French-style mansion cost $10 million to build. They thought nothing of spending a fortune on a ball, $11,000 just on roses. But money was one thing. What the Vanderbilts craved was a title. In 1895, Consuelo Vanderbilt, whose father William had inherited a share of the billion-dollar Vanderbilt fortune, left America for England to marry the ninth Duke of Marlborough. She was to become the dynasty's second American duchess. By the turn of the century, 500 heiresses had been pushed into transatlantic marriages by their socially ambitious parents. Titles were traded for cash. The dollar princesses brought millions into Europe. Consuelo arrived at the Ninth Duke's magnificent ancestral home, Blenheim Palace, with a dowry worth today more than $57 million and an annual income of over two and a half million. But it was a loveless match. On their wedding day, the Duke told his wife, I despise everything that isn't British. Consuela's millions to restore Blenheim to its former glory. But 
but their marriage ended in divorce in 1920. Their eldest son, John, inherited the title to become the 10th Duke. By the end of the First World War, the trade in America's air races had stopped. Or so it seemed. In the 13th century, François Grimaldi seized control of Monaco. Disguised as a monk, he bluffed his way into the fort and murdered the guards. The Grimaldi dynasty have dominated the fortunes of Monaco ever since. Today, the tiny principality is richer than Switzerland. Once described as a sunny place for shady people, it is a tax haven for the rich and famous. The opening of the Monte Carlo Casino in 1861 had secured the fortune of the Grimaldi dynasty. But in the 1930s, the French and Italian governments allowed roulette wheels to be placed in their casinos. Monaco's precious monopoly was lost and the country went into decline. Responsibility for its revival fell on its new prince, Rainier. In 1949, Prince Rainier became the 31st Grimaldi to rule Monaco. The pressure soon grew to find a wife, to produce an heir, and restore Monaco to its former glory. Without an heir, even its independence could come under threat. The search was on for a glamorous princess. Rainier's advisors turned their sights on that new pool of talent and money, Hollywood. Deborah Carr and Natalie Wood were just two of the stars shortlisted for the starring role. But as luck would have it, the Oscar-winning actress Grace Kelly was in town. The daughter of a former bricklayer turned Olympic road and self-made millionaire, she had all the makings of a fairy tale princess. She fulfilled all Rainier's requirements. She was young, beautiful, Catholic, and most importantly of all, independently rich. A little over six months after meeting the prince for the first time, Grace agreed to marry him. The couple had been together just a handful of times, but had got to know each other through their many letters. Behind the public face of the romance, a very different story was unfolding. Grace's father was expected to pay a $12 million dowry. He was incensed. The notion seemed archaic. He refused to sign the marriage contract. A compromise was quickly arranged. By the time his daughter left America for Monaco, Jack Kelly had agreed instead to pay two million dollars towards a state wedding. On April the 12th, 1956, Prince Rainier's yacht drew alongside the US Constitution. The new American heiress procured to improve the blue blood of royalty and its bank balance, Grace Kelly was crucial to the future of the Grimaldi dynasty. The world's press flocked to cover the story of the prince and the showgirl, but few knew of the financial wranglings behind the fairy tale romance. Grace's film studio MGM paid for her $43,000 wedding dress. Rainier was determined Grace would never act again. MGM lost one of their top stars. But in return, the prince gave them the film rights to one of the great spectacles of the decade. The wedding of the century proved to be the turning point in Monica's fortunes. Grace Kelly brought glamour and prosperity to the Principality. 
it became a magnet for the world's new rich. The cash-rich dynasties of America sought to convert their newfound wealth into social status and political power. The Kennedys achieved it all. Of Irish immigrant stock, the Kennedys had always been spurned by American high society. But when John F. Kennedy married Jacqueline Bouvier in 1953, the family got the touch of class they had craved so long. The Bouviers had been on the New York social register since the 19th century. It was a pedigree that appealed to the Kennedy clan. Patriarch Joe Kennedy was one of the richest self-made men in America. In 1957, Fortune magazine estimated he was worth between one and two billion dollars. Prohibition was the making of him. In the 13 driest years in American history, Kennedy made a killing bootlegging liquor. In 1926, he moved to Hollywood. 76 films and six million dollars later, he left his mistress, actress Gloria Swanson, and returned to his wife and family. But it was political power, not money, that drove Joe Kennedy. In 1937, he took his family to Britain to take up the position of American ambassador to the court of St. James. The governor of the Bank of England described him as a man constantly on the make. When he left war-torn London for the safety of the countryside, the press accused him of cowardice. Recalled to Washington, his term in office was a disaster. I am returning to Washington to report to the president. I leave England at this time with real regret. With the death of his eldest son, Joe Jr., during the Second World War, the full glare of Joe's thwarted political ambitions fell on second son, Jack. Joe Kennedy plowed millions into furthering his son's political career. In 1960, Kennedy stood for president. In the last 18 days of the campaign alone, over two and a half million dollars were pumped into his publicity machine. Amidst allegations of boat rigging, John F. Kennedy became the youngest president in American history. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Joe Kennedy's son had become the most powerful man in the world. Kennedy's new style presidency was enhanced by a stylish first lady. As the president set about the affairs of state, Jackie set about refurbishing the family home. She blew the budget in the first month. In the eyes of the world, Jackie had become an icon of style. But her glamorous image came at a price. In just three months, she spent $180,000 on clothes. In 1962 alone, her personal expenditure topped $650,000. God damn it, she's breaking my ass, complained the president. Together, the Kennedys presided over a golden age. They had taken the Kennedy dynasty into a new league. 
glamorous, high-profile life they led was funded by Joe Kennedy's millions. Jack Kennedy never touched his $100,000 presidential salary. He lived off the interest of the $10 million trust fund his father had set up for him. The president and his first lady were the closest thing America ever had to royalty. But on November 22nd, 1963, the dream was shattered. The assassination of John F. Kennedy shocked the world. Kennedy left his fortune and trust for his children. Jackie received the standard presidential widow's pension of $10,000. In addition, she received an income of 175000 a year from the trust. For someone who had been surrounded by vast wealth all her life, it didn't seem much. Financial rescue came in the form of Greek shipping tycoon Aristotle Onassis. Three months before her husband's assassination, Jackie had holidayed on his yacht. Onassis had started his business at the age of 16 with just $60 in his pocket. Trading in tobacco and animal hides, he made his first million by the age of 25. By the time Jackie met him, he had made millions pioneering the oil super tanker. Onassis charmed the first lady. He decked out his famous yacht with flowers and a 60-piece orchestra. When he proposed five years after Kennedy's death, the world was stunned. Jackie Kennedy became Jackie Onassis, marrying into yet another billion-dollar dynasty. Onassis was 62, Jackie 39. He gave his new bride 13 million dollars and set up trust funds for her two children. Jackie once again began to run up enormous bills of more than a quarter of a million dollars a month. It was more than even one of the world's richest men could take. Within two years of marrying, the couple were barely speaking. When Onassis's son and heir Alexander died in a plane crash in 1973, his family begged him to divorce the woman they saw as a curse. could be drawn up, Aristotle and Assets died of bronchial pneumonia. Jackie began a long legal battle over the will of Onassis's heir, Christine. She finally won $26 million and retired from the public spotlight. Christina Onassis was just 25 when she inherited her father's empire. Her vast fortune brought her nothing but misery. In 1984, she married for the fourth time. Her wedding gift to husband, Thierry Roussel, was $20 million to help his failing business. A year after the wedding, Christina gave birth to a daughter, Athena. She was christened Athena Roussel. In 1988, Christina Onassis died of a heart attack. She was 37. In just two generations, the Onassis name had disappeared, but the fabulous fortune remains. On her 18th birthday, Athena will inherit five billion dollars. In the fortunes of any dynasty, one weak link in the chain can spell disaster. The Aga Khans are the spiritual leaders of the world's 15 million Ismaili Muslims. Famous for the thoroughbred horses, they enjoy phenomenal work. But in 1957, the dynasty faced crisis. 
Ali, the dynastic heir, was a renowned playboy. His second marriage in 1949 to the Hollywood star Rita Hayworth sent shockwaves through the Ishmaelis. It was an extravagant affair. Hundreds of bottles of champagne were drunk, a swimming pool scented with 200 gallons of eau de cologne. But the affair worried his father, Aga Khan III. When they married, Rita was already two months pregnant with their daughter, Yasmin. Her arrival did little to dampen Ali's philandering. He showed little interest in his father's religious work, even less in his new wife. Ali spends too much for the both of us, complained Hayworth. In 1951, she sued for divorce. A religious dynasty that relies on the donations of its followers cannot afford to be shrouded in scandal. In 1957, Aga Khan III died. Before his death, he made the painful decision to deny Ali the succession. For the sake of the dynasty, he named his 20-year-old grandson Karim his heir, Ali's eldest son by his first marriage. Three years later, Ali died at the wheel of his Italian sports car. As the fourth Aga Khan, Karim has remodeled the dynasty along the lines of a multinational business empire. Less of a playboy and more of a high-powered chief executive, his personal fortune is worth $1.4 billion. But from his base in France, he spends his time administering the millions of dollars his followers donate each year for the social and economic development of the Ismaili Muslims. The world's most enduring dynasty sacrificed its own king to ensure its survival. As heir to the British throne, Edward, Prince of Wales, cut a dashing and popular figure in the years following the First World War. But the duties of royalty bored the young prince. The future king preferred to dance till dawn and party with his fast-moving set of moneyed friends. In 1931, he met the American Wallace Simpson at a weekend hunting party. They began an all-consuming affair. But five years later, Edward's father, George V, died. Edward was king. The monarchy was thrown into crisis. Twice divorced Wallace Simpson was deemed unsuitable to be queen. Edward chose to surrender his throne for the woman he had showered with love and jewels. You all know the reason which have impelled me to renounce the throne. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. He lost not only a crown, but a fortune. As Prince of Wales, Edward had amassed a private fortune worth almost $60 million. But his financial position was changed forever by his decision to marry the 41-year-old Wallace. After a year of bitter wrangling, it was agreed he would receive a tax-free income worth almost one and a half million. The homes he had inherited from his father were sold to his brother, King George VI, for 16 million. But the money came with a condition. Edward and his new wife were banned from living in Britain forever. The royal line had been preserved, but not without casting its king into the wilderness.
the British monarchy enjoyed two decades of stability and popularity. 1953, Edward's niece, Princess Elizabeth, was crowned queen. I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted queen. Although the British people were still Wherefore enduring rationing eight years after the end of the Second World War, $33 million dollars was spent on the Are coronation. The it was a symbol to the world of the British royal dynasty's ability to survive. The new Elizabethan age had begun. As a constitutional monarch, the queen receives almost $13 million dollars a year from Parliament. On becoming queen, she also inherited a fortune that today has grown to over $400 million. Constantly under examination and threat, the royal family's ability to adapt to the changing times has ensured their survival. With this ring, I do well. In 1981, the, the, the Queen's eldest the son and heir, Prince Charles, married son, Lady Diana son. Spencer. And of the Holy Ghost. And of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Charles's 19-year-old bride was destined to become a global superstar. Just as Grace Kelly had transformed the Grimaldi dynasty, Diana breathed new life into the world's most visible monarchy. She became a fashion icon. In one year alone, she spent almost half a million dollars in clothes, an eighth of her husband's annual income. The most photographed woman in the world loved to break the rules. Once she even appeared wearing an emerald and diamond choker around her forehead. It had been a wedding gift from the Queen. The necklace was just part of the spectacular collection of jewels the Queen's grandmother, Queen Mary, had been presented with at the Delhi Durbar in 1911. The Delhi Durbar was India's chance to pay homage to their new king and emperor. It was an orgiastic feast of gem giving. Amongst the tributes were rubies the size of pigeon eggs and an adornment for the throne 12 inches in diameter carved from a single emerald. The king wore the imperial crown of India. Made at a cost of five million dollars, the Indian people were left to pick up the tab. During the years of old empire, countless priceless jewels had poured into the royal coffers. Queen Victoria had been literally showered with precious gems from the outposts of her empire. But those days had long gone. The 40 years of stability under Queen Elizabeth merely preceded a greater crisis to come. Diana's new blood, which offered such promise, instead threatened the very existence of the monarchy. The scandalous end to the marriage between the Duke and Duchess of York exposed the Windsor dynasty to the scrutiny of an increasingly watchful press. Cast out of the family fold and forced to fend for herself, the Duchess soon ran up debts of over six million dollars. Her sister-in-law Diana fared financially better, walking away from her marriage with 23 million dollars and a new role as Queen of Hearts. As the marriages of her children crumbled around her, the Queen found her finances the subject of public debate. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. The fire that swept through the Queen's ancestral home of Windsor Castle in 1992 was a potent symbol of the changes which engulfed the monarchy. The Queen's decision to pay income tax, the first monarch to do so for more than 60 years, was her public acknowledgement of the need to adapt to ensure the successful continuation of the royal family into the next generation. In her 
inheritance is a heavy burden. At the age of 12, Barbara Hutton, heiress to the five and dime Woolworth Empire, inherited over a quarter of a billion dollars. Nicknamed the poor little rich girl, her fabulous fortune brought her only unhappiness. In a desperate quest for love, she married seven times and paid out millions in alimony. Her life was marked by spectacular excess and spiraling self-destruction. An alcoholic, she finally kicked the habit only to replace it with an addiction to Coca-Cola and barbiturates. Barbara Hutton died alone in 1979, aged 66. Her billion dollar inheritance had been squandered. Just three and a half thousand dollars remained in her bank account. The Hutton fortune had been wiped out. My name is J. Paul Getty. The Oil magnate John Paul Getty's dreams of founding a dynasty were poisoned by his obsession with money. In 1957, Fortune magazine named him the richest man in the world. His billion dollar empire made him half a million dollars richer every day. But Getty was a miser. His meanness was legendary. He charged his grandson $10 for lunch. He even saved bits of string. As Getty pursued ever greater riches, his own family disintegrated around him. In 1973, his grandson, John Paul III, was kidnapped in Italy. When Getty found out about his drug taking, he refused to pay the kidnappers. He only agreed to pay $2 million towards the $3 million ransom when a severed ear arrived in the post. He lent the remaining million to his son, John Paul II, but insisted he pay it back with interest. Getty's only real love was his Californian museum. Before his death in 1976, he rewrote his will, leaving it the bulk of his billion dollar fortune. Overnight, it became the most richly endowed institution in modern history. The Getty name has been a terrible curse. One son killed himself, another became a reclusive alcoholic. His grandson almost died of a drug overdose, while his granddaughter Eileen is a victim of the AIDS virus. The children of John F. Kennedy have grown up in the shadow of their famous parents. The lives of John Jr. and Caroline were marked forever by their father's assassination. legacy he left them was inescapable. Over the course of the years, the children have forged a new era in the Kennedy dynasty. The Kennedy name has proved to be a valuable one. In 1994, following the death of their mother, John and Caroline auctioned the Kennedy legacy. The personal belongings of Jackie Kennedy Onassis were sold to members of the public wanting to own their part of the Kennedy dream. Kennedy heirs profited handsomely. They became $34 million richer. The world remains fascinated by the fortunes of the great dynasties. They both rely on the media and are cursed by them. Everyone. Camera. Camera. As we enter the new millennium, the modern generations are forced to live their lives under the glaring spotlight of the international press pack. As debate surrounds a succession to the British throne, the full weight of public expectation rests on the shoulders of Prince Charles and ultimately his son, Prince William. The world is watching to see how they will lead the British monarchy into the next century. As never before, the 
great dynastic families have been forced to adapt to changing times. The Grimaldis have evolved into a thoroughly modern dynasty. It may be dogged by scandal, but that simply raises the principality's profile. Rainier has transformed his tiny kingdom into a phenomenally successful business. The inheritance he will leave his son and heir, Prince Albert, is in much better shape than it was 50 years ago. But like any heir, it is now up to Albert to nurture his dynasty's fabulous fortune. It is, after all, a simple matter of blood and money.